The archaeology is a discipline that studies human past in a long-term perspective. Therefore, it deals with the potentially one of the largest data sets of all uh, sources, everything from earliest human origins around two and a half million years ago uh, until today is potentially interesting. And that's a lot of data. But for archaeology, the past does not exist as such. Past lingers as the material remains in the present. It persisted because of the durability, because someone took care of it, uh, or due to the suitable conditions. Ontologically, the past exists as a trace, a kind of material remain of event or a process. And most of them are just traces like footprints, cut marks, isotope ratios, DNA, and stuff like that, and stuff like that. And because the past is not just human past, it's about entanglement of humans within the material world. Therefore, traces are everywhere. Sediments, uh, genetic code of every li living species in the world, pollen ratios, et cetera, et cetera. They're all traces also of human past. And some traces are more than just traces. They are objects crafted according to a plan, according to a pattern, to an idea, maybe even expressed in a language. Tools, weapons, buildings, settlement, landscapes. And some of them are even more. They are symbols. They stand for some complex social conventions. Archaeological sensibility is concerned with the mundane, with where every trace is potentially interesting. While shuffling through the detritus of the past, everything, literally everything is potentially interesting, can bring some new insight into the, into the past. But traces themselves are not archeological records, nor they are knowledge. Archeological record is constructed, assembled to work, to field work, to research, through detecting and recording meaningful traces. If we look at what archaeologists actually do, they code reality into data. The process of knowledge production is a process of recognizing traces, recording data, and abstracting, linking, combining data together into more and more abstract representations. So, Archaeology of the last decade is marked by the explosion of new traces that we can potentially recognize and bring completely new insights of the past. Ancient DNA, isotopes, lipids open up to completely new aspects of the past that we thought that are lost forever. But the knowledge arises from the... the arises from what data reveals and aggregate. Namely, we might realize even of it new things by combining data in new ways. The constant enhancement of digital applications for produ producing, storing, and manipulating data has brought into focus data-driven and data-led science, even in archaeology. In recent decades, especially digitalization, has increased exponentially the amount of data that, that can be processed and used. And this datafication goes even beyond digitalization. And once you have digital objects standing for the real phenomena, for the real traces, what can you do with them that you couldn't do, do before? This led to a new wave of optimism in archaeology. Optimism about the interpretative range of archaeology comparable only with the optimism of new archaeology of the uh, 60s. And this is called the first scientific revolution by Christian Christiansen. So while the first science revolution would have taken place in the period between uh, begin, mid 19th century, when archaeology profited from the scientific breakthrough in the field of cultural, uh, biological and geological evolution, the second science revolution around mid 20th century with the introduction of radiocarbon dating and um, wild application of uh, zoo archaeology and paleobotanics, the 
uh, the third science revolution are in the fields, especially in the development of new scientific methods in archaeology, quantitative modeling, and big data. But getting data in archaeology is, at least compared to other fields, is relatively slow, it's quite expensive, and it's labor intensive. And resulting archaeological record is due to the many factors, fragmented, incomplete, also due to the way we produce knowledge in archaeology, as uh, Andrew Jones in his book uh, showed, we are faced with a kind of process of fragmentation of exploding the, the archaeological data, which explodes the unified site or phenomena into explosion of data, reports, papers, data sets. And, and this poses a new a set of new challenges to archaeology. Okay, so we will continue from here, but first let's see what data actually is. What is data? Data is commonly understood to, to be the raw material produced by abstracting the world into categories, measurements, and other representational forms, numbers, characters, symbols, images, sounds, el electromagnetic waves, bits that constitute the building blocks from which information and knowledge are created. Etymologically, the word data is derived from the uh, Latin dare, meaning to give. In this sense, data are the raw elements that can be abstracted or given by phenomena, measured and recorded in various ways. However, in general use, data refer to those elements that are taken, measured, extracted through observation, computations, experiments, and record keeping. Uh, the capta would be a better word than data. And data are usually uh, representative in, uh, in nature. For example, measurements of phenomena such as shirt with its weight, uh, color, fabric, but can also be implied through the absence rather than presence or, or can be derived data that is produced from other data such as percentage change over time, calculating by comparing data from two time periods, for example. And over time, data came to be understood as a kind of pre-analytical and pre-factual, different in nature to the facts, to the evidence, to the information, and to the knowledge. But the key element in constitution of these elements. Thus, the facts are, in a way, ontological. Evidence is epistemological, but data is just rhetorical. In rhetorical terms, data are that which exists prior to argument or interpretation that converts them into facts, evidence and information. So a data or datum may also be a fact, just as fact might be evidence. However, the existence of data is independent of corresponding ontological truth. So when the fact is proven false, it ceases to be a fact. It's not fact anymore, but false data is still a data. Yeah? And data can take many different forms, uh, including numbers, text, symbols, images, sounds, and et cetera, et cetera. And those are typically divided into two broad categories. Quantitative data consists of numeric uh, records. Generally, such data is ex extensive and relate to physical properties of phenomena, such as length, height, distance, weight, area, volume, et cetera, et cetera. Quantitative data have four different levels of measurements, which delimit how can they, they be processed and analyzed. Such data can be analyzed using visualizations, a variety of descriptive and inferential statistics, and can be used as an input to predictive and simulation models. In contrast, uh, the qualitative data are non-numeric, such as text, pictures, arts, video, sounds, music. While qualitative data can be converted into the quantitative data, this transformation, translations, involve significant re reduction and abstraction, and much of the richness of the original data is lost in a process or can be lost in the process. So qualitative data 
analysis is generally practiced on the original materials, seeking to build up understanding rather than subjecting the data to the computational techniques. However, there was a significant improvement in processing and analyzing uh, qualitative data computationally using techniques such as, such as machine learning and data mining. And those techniques will be uh, the subject of this, of this workshop. There are basically two primary ways in which data can be generated. The first, the data can be captured directly from some sort of me measurement, such, a, such as observations, survey slab, field equipment, etc., etc., etc. In this case, data are usually the deliberate product of measurement. There's, there was an intention to generate this data. In contrast, the exhaust data are inherently produced by a device or systems, but are kind of byproduct of the main function. So for example, when you do the magnetic survey using geophysics, the, the, the primary data is the you know, magnetic response, the, 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 the deviations in magnetic field. This is capture data. But the, the sensors also record a lot of other stuff, the velocity, the temperature, and stuff like that. And this is the exhaust data, which can be used or not. <clears throat> so uh, many software-enabled systems produce such exhaust data much of which can be valuable source of information in some cases. For example, web server logs can give a lot of insight into the user's behavior on the website. In other cases, exhaust data is just transient in nature. That is, it can never be examined or processed and simply discarded, like in this case with the magnetometer. Captured and exhaust data are considered raw in the sense that they have not been converted or combined with other data. In contrast, derived data are produced through additional processing or analysis of the captured data. Uh, derived data are generally uh, generated for a number of reasons, including to reduce the volume of data uh, to a manageable uh, amount, to produce more useful or meaningful measures, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. For example, here are different levels of processing that NASA uses for this Earth observation system. So different levels of uh, processed data. Okay, and then we can have structure versus unstructured data. Structured data are those that can be easily organized, stored, or transferred in a definitive data model such as numbers, text set out in a table of relational database that have a consistent format. For example, uh, context recording sheet is structured data in a way. Uh, and since such data can be processed, searched, queried, combined, and analyzed relatively, uh, relatively stra straightforward using algorithms or visualized, etc., etc., etc. And then we have the semi-structured data this is loosely structured data. They have no predefined data model or, sch or scheme, so you know, the forms, uh, and cannot be held in a relation database. And an example of this is our XML uh, tagged web pages, etc. And this is quite um, this system is quite quite often used in archaeology for tagging and linking um, qualitative and unstructured data. In contrast, unstructured data do not have a definite data model or common uh, identifiable structure. Each individual element, such as narrative, text, photo, may have a specific structure or format, but not all data within the data set share the same structure. As such, they can be queried and searched. They are not easily combined and computationally analyzed. Such unstructured data are usually qualitative in nature and can be often be converted into structured data through classification and categorization. And I would say the most of archae at least historical, um, archeological historical data is unstructured in, in nature. And there are projects that aim to produce at least semi-structured data out of it. such projects 
uh, projects such as Ariadne, for example, uh, are striving to, you know, link data, uh, tag it, uh, and convert it in a kind of semi-structured system. In an age of big data, many massive data sets consist of semi or unstructured data, such as archives, repositories, uploaded pictures and videos, blogs. Some estimates suggest that uh, such data is growing at least five ta 15 times the rate of structured data. So much more data that is produced is unstructured in, in nature. And especially with advances in uh, data database design, such as no SQL databases that don't need structure, and machine learning uh, are aiding this storage and analysis of this kind of um, unstructured databases. Again, yeah, this has led up to, to um, big data. While there is no fixed definition what big data is, people often mention three Vs that characterize it. No? Three Vs are volume, velocity, and variety. So big data includes information from multitude of sources, including social media, smartphones and mapping, recording equipment, and the number of data sharing, data producing devices is growing exponentially. So this hardware, collectively known as the Internet of Things, includes machine sensors and consumer-oriented devices such as connected thermostats, light bulbs, refrigerators, well health monitors, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, producing the volumes of, of data. And the big data is a uh, fact of the late capitalism, described as a kind of surveillance capitalism by Susanna Zuboff, a kind of novel market form and specific logic of capitalist accumulation, a radically disembedded and extractive variant of information capitalism based on commodification of reality and its transformation into behavioral data for analysis and sales, a market-driven process where the commodity for sale is your personal data, and the capture and production of this data relies on mass surveillance on the internet. So basically, when your fridge spies on you and corporations profit from the data that your fridge is producing. Yeah, so the big data is huge in volume, consisting of terabytes or petabytes of data. It's high in velocity being created in near or in real time and diverse in a variety and type, being structured and structured in nature and often temporarily and spatially referenced. So other characteristics of big data are also that it's exhaustive in scope, striving to capture the entire populations or systems, or at least much larger sample sizes that would be employed in traditional small data studies. And it's usually fine-grained in, in resolution, aiming to be as detailed as possible and uniquely indexical in identification, relational in nature, containing common fields that enable to join, join it with different uh, data sets. The most defining characteristic of big data is its large volume. The last decade has witnessed an explosion in the amount of data that are being generated and processed on a, on a, on a daily basis. We are entering the petabyte age. The ra rate of growth has been staggering in scale and they're set to grow exponentially for the foreseeable future. These are the, let's say, scales of, of, of data, and we are uh, entering the exabyte uh, stage. And it is estimated that the, at least 90% of all data in the world has, be, has been generated in the last two years alone. This huge amount of data uh, requires the uh, enormous infrastructure uh, in forms of data centers that also requires uh, large quantities of energy. So big data is material in a way. It's very material. It's not just existing in a cloud as an idea. 
it requires this kind of infrastructure, which is growing rapidly uh, across the world. So for example, the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, the European Particle Physics Laboratory, generates a 40 terabytes of data every se second. 40 terabytes every second. So the data generated is so vast that they, they, it doesn't get analyzed nor stored, consisting instead of transient data. Indeed, the capacity to store all this data does not exist because although storage is expanded rapidly, it does not keep pace with the data generation. We produce more data than we are able to store. Spatial data especially has grown enormously in the recent years from uh, real-time uh, remote sensing and radar imagery to the large crowdsourcing projects such as OpenStreetMap, to digital spatial trace uh, created by uh, GPS re receivers embedded in devices. And it's spatially exhaustive, ca capturing the terrain of the entire planet, mapping the infrastructure of the whole countries and pro providing you know, different data sets. And in addition to the exhaustivity covering the whole planet, the big data are becoming much more fine-grained in their resolution. Let's say in the late 1980s, the highest resolution images of the Earth's surface available uh, to the most known government researcher were those by, were taken by the Landsat satellite, where each pixel relates to a 30 by 30 meters uh, parcel of land. Now, standardly av available satellite imagery is below half meter resolution. <clears throat> So the quantity of high resolution aerial and satellite imagery available to archeologists has expanded exponentially. Commercially acquired sub-meter resolution satellite imagery with spectral coverage in the visible and near infrared with global coverage is continuously produced and archive data is increasingly easy to access. And national high resolution topographic data sets derived from elbow laser scanning with national coverages have been uh, more and more available and used by archaeologists. Yeah, and there are still untapped potentials of archival data with millions and millions of aerial photographs collected over the last hundred years. And there is also the prospect of crowdsourced data with data collected by individual drones and you know, uploaded into the internet. A fundamental difference between small data and big data is the dynam dynamic nature of data generation. Small data usually consist of studies that are kind of freeze-framed at the particular space and time. Even in the longitudinal studies, the data is captured in discrete times, every few months, every few years. One of the characteristics of big data is velocity. It's being constantly produced. Velocity occurs because repeated Observations are continuously made over time and space and which many systems operating in perpetual always on mode. For example, websites continuously rec record logs that tracks all visits and activity undertaken on the site. Remote sensed images are collected continuously and accumulate rapidly. And then it's variety. Both small and big data can be varied in the nature, being structured, unstructured, or semi-structured, consisting of numbers, text, images, videos, audio, and other kinds of data. In big data, these different kinds of data are more likely to be combined and linked together into conjoining structured and unstructured data. A key advance with regard to big data is how they differ from earlier forms of digital data management which was extremely proficient at processing and storing numerical data using relational databases and which enable different or various kinds of statistical analyzers. It was, however, much, much weaker at handling non-numeric uh, data forms other than storing them. Advances in the Distributed computing and uh, database design using especially no SQL techniques and structures and in data mining and uh, knowledge discovery techniques 
artificial intelligence have hugely increased the capacity to manage, process, and extract information from unstructured data. And indeed, it is uh, suggested that approximately 80% of all data is unstructured in, in nature. And there are also other Vs associated with, with, with big data. One is veracity, which represents the unreliability inherent in some so sources of data. Uh, thus, big data is, can be imprecise and uncertain. Yeah, that's another facet of big data. While variability and complexity are two addi additional dimensions of big data that refer to variation in uh, data flow rates. So the, 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 the flow of data is not constant. There are peri periodic leaks and, and, and uh, truth. And uh, complexity refers to the fact that big data are generated through a multiplicity of sources. And this imposes a critical challenge. The need to connect match, cleanse, and transform data received from different sources together. And that's also the challenge of archaeological big data. So what has this big data phenomenon to do with archaeology? We are dealing potentially with the largest data set of, of them all. And since everything that, that is existing today was made in the past, everything is a potential source of the traces of the past. Every data source can potentially contain data about the past. So remote sensing is a typical uh, example where you know, the uh, patterns of vegetation can reveal archeological traces. Large scale geological surveys for, generates data that is also related to or, or inter, potentially interesting uh, to the archaeology. Construction work also generates a lot of data, and some of these data could be potentially interesting for, for archaeology. Precision farming now, where you, know, you have a kind of a surveillance farming, when you uh, 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 control all aspects of, of your field using different sensors and uh, a method produce a lot of data that, that is potentially relevant to, to archaeology. And there's also billions and billions of geocoded photos that people make on their archaeological sites and upload to, on Instagram, for example. And uh, this data was, for example, used to reconstruct the, the Palmyra that was destroyed by, by, by ISIS using the uh, crowdsourced uh, photographs uploaded on, on different si sites. The practice of uh, preventive archaeology is producing a lot, a lot of data. Uh, lab procedures are getting more and more automated. A lot of measurements and analyzes can be done on a field using handheld sensors and machines that produce a lot of data. The data acquisition is getting cheaper. Field recording is getting more and more automated and or semi-automated using drones, laser scanning, photogrammetry and uh, uh, methods and stuff like this, that and stuff like that, producing more and more archaeological data. And in a few years, we can imagine packs of small robots roaming the fields and collecting and counting the shirts on the field. Also, maybe measuring geophysical properties. And th this technology is already available. Just someone has to, you know, apply it for archaeology. And in a few decades, we can imagine uh, swarms of nanorobots that will swarm within the soil and ro record the chemical composition of every cubic millimeter of the earth soil cover. And this is technology that. It's, it's currently being developed in, in medicine for, you know, treating cancer and stuff like that, but can be also used and uh, applied in archaeology. And this will also produce loads and loads of, da of data. You see what I'm getting it? The archaeology cannot escape the big data challenge. However, as I said before, 
the archaeological record is fragmentary by its nature and by the way we produce it and dispersed. Uh, archaeology therefore brings a very particular kind of challenge to the concept of big data. Rather than real-time analysis of the shifting data landscape of data produced by the day-to-day -day transaction of millions of people and billions of devices, approaches to the big data and archaeology refer to the shifting and reverse engineering of masses of data derived from both primary and secondary investigations into the kind of new understanding of the, the kind of complete archaeological record uh, that can bring a new understanding of uh, the past. And if we want it or not, we are already faced with the big data. There is always more available remote sensing data for any piece of earth surface than we are able to process using traditional methods. And as we process and interpret our data, new data has been produced and available. This is the result of the uh, velocity of big data. So the experience of the large scale mapping projects, such as this monumental national mapping program by the English heritage has shown that traditional ways of dealing with data is almost impossible. Yeah? So the big data poses a set of new questions and challenges regarding the nature of archaeological research and data. The understanding of big data only as a quantity is not enough. Big data is not just a quantity. If for no other reason than for the circular problem of defining what is big and what is only large when small becomes big. Yeah? The real epistemological problem with big data is not the quantity of data, but the new quality that emerges from this vast quantity. Thus, the solution for the big data is not more or better techniques or technology, technologies to shrink big data back to the manageable size, but in rethinking the epistemological status of the big data and understanding what is this new quality that it brings. So big in big data is in relation to us, humans. We embodied human beings are simply not equipped to see and comprehend the intangible entity that is big data. We are unable to fully interact with it and incapable to evaluate the meaning or outcome of these interactions. Big data is kind of sublime excess of meaningless detail and we are lost in it. Yeah. So compared to small data, which has high accuracy, less errors and high quality, remember data that is collected with, with intention, with, with uh, idea what we measure. Big data is inherently imprecise and messy. While previously, mostly everything was a signal was something that we collected on purpose. Now 99% of, of data is noise, it's garbage, it's just collected, it's an exhaust of some process. Yeah? And this can completely overwhelm us, especially if we are unable to uh, filter all this information, process this information. So for every single piece of Earth's surface, there can be thousands or billions or uh, millions of different images and data sets in different wavelengths, collected with different sensors, with different resolutions at different times, with different atmospheric and ground conditions. And this data is highly correlated. There's a lot of redundant data in these data sets. So no matter how highly correlated those data sets are, no matter how high is redundancy and dimensionality of these data sets, each still produces unique perspective on Earth's surface. So we cannot just discard and take one picture. We need to see it as a whole, but the whole is mostly redundant and uh, messy. Yeah? And this radical change in noise and signal ratio makes human data relation asymmetric. 
there is a sense of kind of uncanniness and helplessness in relation to big data. No matter how we try, we cannot fully comprehend it. However, if we accept the messiness of big data and surrender the urge of making it small, neat, unambiguous, we can get a lot of new information in return, new things to consider, new opportunities and to gain surpri surprising new insights to realize. We get scale and trends, very deep micro detail, longitudinal baseline measures, normal deviation patterns, contingency adjustment uh, anomalies, and especially the, the insight into the emergent phenomena, the patterns that are large-scale patterns within the data. Dealing with the inherently messy big data requires new mode of skills of interacting with data. Based on scale, trend, exceptions, variability, probability, patterns and predictions, which are not necessarily natural modes for humans, yeah? A big data requires new modes of using data for knowledge production that extend and complement the traditional scientific methods, such as deep learning, hierarchical representations, neural networks, and information visualization. And big data also changes the, how we engage with data. It requires that we delegate our cognitive abilities to the non-humans. With computers, computer algorithms and humans working together, where the machines handles the, the large majority, maybe 99% of routine, repeatable work, and human dealing only with the rest, mainly posing questions, examining interesting patterns, and handling exception cases. And there are already available tools for this in, in archaeology uh, that can handle manual and repeating boring tasks, such as Registration of images, for example, uh, yeah, putting them in context. Detection of, of uh, yeah, it's another example of uh, automatic registration of aero photo uh, archive of Austria yeah, that was done automatically. To the automatic detect, uh, detection of, of features or transcription of, uh, of uh, remote sensed images. And although interpretation of archeological features is still uniquely human skill, specialized algorithms can at least isolate potential features and assist operation, operator in interpretation of archeological features using remote sensed images. And I wrote this eight years ago, and I was completely wrong. Because um, the rapid development in artificial intelligence, especially in the field of deep learning, uh, makes computers, computer algorithms performing skill-based tasks with much greater speed, precision, and accuracy than humans in a now, already now. And we may, might expect that uh, computers will be able to perform the interpretation of images in a few years. And there's also fast approaching and eventually poss possibility of non-human agency in discovery, yeah? And in potential moment where tools are becoming more advanced than humans in some tasks. This could lead to the computer programs, not just assisting in knowledge production, but actually producing knowledge, leading to the non-human entities that are able to see more than us. This is, of course, a joke, yeah? But, you know, it, 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 it kind of illustrates that non-human entities are able to produce knowledge in a way that is for us, di difficult to, to, to digest or understand. Maybe in a few decades, in a few years, a few decades, uh, there will be entities that will be, will be able to see more than us and produce knowledge about the past from Huli. Huge, automatically collected data sets completely bypassing us, humans.
So automatic scientific inquiry is yet another way in which big data science is shifting traditional way we do science and um, archaeology. Big data reframes key questions about the constitution of knowledge, the process of research, how we engage with information, and the nature and categorization of reality. The big data brought a new wave of, I must say, naive optimism that once we have all the data, the big data, when the sample size is all, everything, uh, it means that we don't no longer need theory. With enough data, the numbers will speak from, from themselves. No, they won't. Data in the sense of evidence is only data for the theory or hypothesis. Expecting that the past will write itself using automated algorithms from the big data is false. Even more than ever, big data needs big questions that leads to big research. And big questions need big theory. We need to think big. In the age of big data, we need to think big. And that's the, I would say, biggest challenge of big data. This change of scale, thinking and working big, challenges many assumptions about the nature of knowledge, how we produce knowledge. What is knowledge in archaeology? What, what are the narratives we, we produce? Because we, being embodied human agents, we feel most at home with things that fit in our hands such as artifacts or features that can be explored and negotiated using our bodies, such as buildings, features, and sites, engaging with bigger entities, such as land landscapes, globe, gives us a sense of impotence, as we cannot rely on our bodies to provide sense of scale anymore. So big data requires us to kind of leave this, what I call, cozy little hobbit words behind and start to tackle entities that are much larger than this manageable thing, such as artifacts, sites, or region. And this also means compiling, managing, interpreting, and understanding archaeological data on a planetary scale in a way that it hasn't been done before. It means that we need to pose a whole new set of questions. For example, the quality of matter removed from original context and moved across the landscape by humans after being quarried, built, used, discarded from the place to scene to present. It means that we need to understand kind of cumulative effect of leaving people carrying all out individual actions which resulted in what we see today as a modern world. We need to explore the global archaeological record, searching for patterns like macro-scale cultural phenomena that emerge from the noise of uh, micro-scale events. This, this is one of the books that uh, advocates this way of uh, looking at archaeological record, macro-scale approach towards archaeology that reveals a kind of large-scale patterns in space and time using micro-scale, micro-detail of archaeological record. And big data also um, allow us to tackle enormous things, large things such as landscape, hyper-objects, and even the full history itself. So, oh, OGS uh, Crawford suggested that history is like a carpet, such as uh, uh, like a carpet whose pattern can only be discerned from a distance. Uh, and the reason why uh, historians of the past, archaeologists, has been unsuccessful in recognizing the pattern of history was due to the inadequate data. You know, you cannot see the pattern of the carpet when only a minute portion of, uh, of it is discovered, uncovered. So this metaphor kind of was about the need to change scale and perspective to understand large scale historical uh, processes and big data allow us to tackle them. And 
this, this shift has been already done in archaeology. We have uh, evolutionary the theories as are especially popular in the recent decades for understanding the long-term uh, development of uh, human history. And they, then you have a bit weird approaches such as, such as cleodynamics by Peter Turchin from University of Connecticut, who treats history as a kind of quantitative science, finding patterns and predictions, uh, or as he calls it, kind of evolution of civilization using quantitative data and uh, computational modeling. If you are thinking big, let's go all the way, let's go all the way. And nobody taught history in bigger terms than Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. Yeah? His philosophy of history is the most grand and intricate understanding of history. And if anything, big data can help us to kind of test or use his insight of, of history as of the way of the spirit, the direction of logic and history, which is the direction of liberation of spirit, uh, where spirit tries to overcome its own uh, contradiction, etc., etc. So what I'm saying is big data allow us to think and work big. This kind of critical framework that big data is advancing in response to even a ever more linkable mass uh, of information each themselves becoming larger in size as hardware and software barriers lower, allow us to go beyond what is available just from excavation and survey. It allows us not only to think big, but also to use this big thinking for seeing previously unaccessible things. With big data, we can see the whole carpet in greater detail and the completely new levels of complexity.